This is lesson one from my newest course called The Mind of a Man, how to understand a man and communicate the right message to him. I've also created a new course for men called The Mind of a Woman, how to understand a woman and communicate the right message to her. I have a variety of other helpful relationship training courses specifically designed for Christian singles who want to honor God in marriage one day. To access all of these courses in their entirety, feel free to learn more about enrolling in AGW University by clicking the link in the description of this video. Lastly, I'm currently offering a scholarship for everyone who enrolls before the September 1st deadline. But if you're watching this content after that deadline passes by, feel free to still visit AGW University by clicking the link in the description below to see what current offers are available. This is lesson one of the course called The Mind of a Man. And today we're gonna be talking about what does a man want and why does he want it? As we know, as Christians, we all want love. God made us to want his love and the love of other people. As Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus said all of the Bible is summarized basically with love God and love people. And we know that God gave us the scriptures for our good. God's commandments are for our good. They tell us what God made us to do. And so we can summarize that God made us to want his love and to love other people, to love God and to love people. Now, right from the start, we want to clarify that certainly God's love is what we need most. God's love is best. And that's why that comes first in the commandment. Not only does God deserve our love because he is the most glorious and deserving, but he's also loved us the most, and therefore we must love him the most. With that said, before sin came into the picture, we see this statement in Genesis where God said to Adam, it is not good for man to be alone. And then it says in the back half of that verse, Genesis 2.18, that God made the woman to fit with Adam. Now, while God made Adam and Eve, men and women, to fit together, it's also clear that he made them different, which is why he has male and female. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. If men and women were exactly the same, there would be no reason to make two genders. They would just be man and man or woman and woman, but God made them to fit together, but he made them differently. And because of these differences mixed with the sin that later occurs in Genesis 3, an immense amount of confusion occurs between men and women in relationships because we think we're the same sometimes, or we just know we're way different, but the fact is we are different and it's very difficult to understand what the opposite sex is thinking and feeling and why they're acting the way they're acting. So again, this study is to help the women understand the men better. And to do that, we should go back to the beginning and see what God intended. So in this lesson, we're really going to be focusing on Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. So why do men want what they want? It's the old question, nature versus nurture. Is it the biology or is it the psychology? Is there something in a man that just grows and sprouts no matter where you plant him? Or is it the environment that's shaping the type of person that he's becoming? Many people have tried to answer this question. So here's my take on it. God has made people in a specific way, but then people make choices in how they use what God has made them to be. So we, in other words, God has designed a man to be a specific way, but his environment and his choices will alter how he's using 
what God has made him to be. So God has made a man a certain way, but his choices and environment influence the way that that man is operating. Here's an analogy, a car versus a truck. You can use a car to tow something heavy, but it's not designed for towing. It's designed for driving, getting good gas mileage, maybe for speed. You can take a truck to the racetrack. You can race it. You can put it up against a car, but it's not going to get a very good time. It's not going to do very well in the race because it wasn't designed for speed. It was designed for towing. So my point is you can use your vehicle however you want to use your vehicle and it might work a little bit. You could probably tow a little bit with a car but it's not designed for that. And it's not going to work very well if you're using your car in a way that it's not designed to work. And vice versa, when you do use a truck for towing, because that's what it was made for, it's gonna work great. And when you take a fast car to a, a racetrack, it's gonna go great because that's what it was designed for. My point, men and women can act however they want to act, but they're only going to thrive when they embrace God's design for how he made them to act. So the natural, innate, biological, and spiritual components that God has endowed on men and women are unchangeable. However, we can all choose to use those tools, those gender identities, those things that God has given us. We can choose to use those however we want, but it's not gonna go well if we reject God's design, and it will go well when we embrace God's design. So to see God's original intent, we should go back to what it says in Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So right from the beginning, it says that we were made in God's image. We were made to rule over his creation. We were made to multiply. And these are all things, as we'll talk about shortly, that reflect God. Again, we're made in God's image. And when you really study what that means in scripture, it's another way of saying that we were made to glorify God. When you study what the glory of God is, it's when the invisible qualities of God are made visible, when the unknowable parts of God are made knowable. So when God reveals himself, the scriptures call that the glory of God. And so God made us humans, men and women, to bear his image because he made us to bring him glory. So again, you glorify God by revealing God accurately. So we didn't choose to be rulers over God's creation. God made us like that. We didn't choose to be able to multiply and have children. God made us like that. We're not smarter than all of creation. That's not why we are the rulers. God made us smarter so that we could rule over it because that's the design he had. As a side note, obviously we're not thriving as much as some of God's creation, but that goes back to my point because the animal kingdom embraces their uh, design when they're in their natural habitat. They thrive in their natural habitat because they embrace the design that God made them to be in that natural habitat. And 
Humans struggle in our natural habitat because we're constantly rejecting God's design for us. So going back to our question, this is what we're talking about in this, this lesson. Why does a man want what he wants? And the simple answer is he wants what he wants because that's how God made him. That's what I'm going to be talking about in this lesson. I'm going to talk about what God made a man to want. Now, I do want to clarify, in the next lesson, I'm going to talk about the environmental choices and changes that have occurred in men that have corrupted these good desires, like sin. And so you can know this is a good desire from a man, this is a bad desire from a man. Because I'm not saying everything a man wants is just because God made him that way. Again, sin has come into the picture. It has messed it up. And now we need to navigate what's a good desire and what's a bad desire in men so that you can know what's a good guy, what's something that he should be wanting, and what's something he shouldn't be wanting. But in this lesson, I'm going to be talking about the ideal. I'm going to go back to the original of what God wanted for men. So here are seven things that God designed a man to want. And more specifically, these are seven things God designed a man to want in a woman. Number one, a man wants a companion, not a competitor. A man wants a woman who's going to be a good companion for him. Right from the beginning, God made men and women to be companions with each other. Because of sin, there's going to be a lot of conflict and fighting. But again, we're talking about the ideal here. So a man wants that original purpose for a woman in his life because it wasn't good for him to be alone. So he wants that woman who's going to come alongside of him and be a companion. In Genesis 2, 18 through 25, it states, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, the, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had made from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Sin had not yet occurred, but again, it said it was not good for man to be alone. So we see that it's good for man and women to be together. Also, we see that in this passage, it said there wasn't a, a helper fit for him. And then God made woman to fit perfectly with Adam. So we see that men and women are designed to go together. Of course, some people are called to singleness, but in general, men and women are designed to have a companion from the opposite sex. We also see that Eve was taken from the substance of Adam, all the other creatures weren't formed from Adam. So he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So we can say that they are of the same essence, but they are different entities. They're made from the same stuff, but they're two different individuals. So why did God make a need in Adam for a companion? Why didn't God just make Adam to be content with just God himself? Because again, it's really important to ha keep highlighting that point. This occurred before sin. This is not some flaw in Adam where it's like, oh, I got messed up. You know, Adam needs a woman. I'm not enough. Or there's sin in Adam, so he's not content. I got to give him something more. This is how God made him from the start before sin. And I think one of the reasons God did that was, again, because he made Adam in his image. So for eternity, God has been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the Trinitarian God. He's a community within himself. Right from the start, you see God's always talking in the plural. We'll make man in our image, in the image of God. He created them. So because of this, since we're made in his image, it makes perfect sense that God made us to need other people of the same essence because, again, God is community within himself. Therefore, it makes sense that a 
a human has the communal nature in himself as well. So by knowing what a man wants, he wants a companion, we can also state what a man's going to try to avoid. And the opposite of a companion is a competitor. Sadly, because of sin, men and women are going to have tons of conflict together. And there's going to be this unhealthy competition for control. So while a godly man should know that there's always going to be some sort of conflict to overcome in any healthy relationship, he's also going to do his best to avoid a woman who he feels like the future just holds an immense amount of conflict. Again, hopefully a godly man is mature enough to know I'm going to have to deal with conflict. The woman's going to deal with conflict with him too. They're both imperfect people. But just know that generally speaking, a man if he feels like a woman is going to constantly be a competitor and a source of conflict in his life, he's going to try to avoid that woman. A man wants a woman who can be in the boat with him, rowing in the same direction. He doesn't want a woman rowing this way while he's rowing that way. And really, if you know anything about boats, you just spin in a circle when you're both rowing in the opposite direction. He doesn't want that. He wants his life to be going in a good direction with a woman as his companion side by side. Number two, a man wants a woman who is feminine in her relationship roles, not masculine. So I'm not talking about the stereotypical masculine feminine traits. I'm not talking about hobbies or liking sports or fixing cars or baking and you kind of put these uh, genders in these stereotypical places. I'm talking about the actual gender roles in a relationship. If you looked at my wife and me, we actually exhibit some uh, different sociological traits that are typically associated with uh, male and female gender. For example, a person like me who's very interested in relationships and people is actually exhibiting some more feminine traits when it comes to sociology and psychology. Whereas my wife is actually pretty good and handy at fixing things. I usually take on the bigger projects when there's something that needs to get built or fixed just because I have more work experience in that field. But if you just presented us with something broken and I had to figure it out and Bethany, my wife, had to figure it out, oftentimes she's a lot faster at figuring that kind of thing out because that's just not the way my brain uh, works best. So does that mean we're sinning because she does something a little more masculine and I do something a little bit more feminine when you put it in that general cultural context? Of course not. We're talking about what the Bible says, not what sociology or psychology places us in. When it comes to the Bible, there are specific gender roles in the relationship. I'm not gonna fully unpack all those. I will talk about them a little bit from the perspective of Ephesians 5. But I'm not going to fully dive into all of that, what the Bible says, because I've talked about that at great length in my other course called Marriage Material. So again, this isn't about housework. This isn't about salaries, different job positions, who puts the kids to bed. That is not what we're talking about. But there are gender-specific masculine and feminine roles in the relationship. For example, in Genesis 2.24, it states, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So in that passage right there, you have very different roles but are that are very gender specific. A woman cannot be a husband. A woman cannot be a father. A man cannot be a wife and a man cannot be a mother. But in this passage we just read, we have those gender roles. When you go to Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, you have the real specific outline roles, specifically about marriage, that a husband is to lead his wife as Christ leads the church and the wife is to uh, respect and submit, meaning she follows and supports his leadership in the context of their relationship and marriage. And that is to reflect how the church responds to Christ. I bring all that up because a man is looking for a woman who can fulfill this specific role in his life. He's not looking for a woman who can be another masculine presence in his life. He's looking for a woman who can, who can do only what a woman can do. Only a woman can be a wife to a man. Only a woman can be a mother to a man's children. And a man is looking for a woman who wants 
that role in his life. By studying Genesis 3, you can see how badly it goes when we don't embrace the gender roles that God made for us in the context of marriage. So I won't go too deep into this, but if you read through Genesis 3, you'll see that Satan's talking to Eve, but God talks to Adam. And that's a very specific, uh, there's a specific reason for that. Because when you read Genesis 2, God actually gave the commands to Adam before Eve was ever even created. He told Adam what to do. Don't eat from this tree, eat from these trees. And Eve wasn't even made yet. So God made Adam the steward of God's commands as the leader in the relationship. And when Satan wanted to attack this married couple. He attacked their roles. He talked to Eve and Eve was leading in that situation where uh, Satan was talking to them. Adam was there. He was just passively letting Eve lead and he followed her into sin. And when God says, talks to them. He doesn't talk to Eve, even though she was the one who was talking to Satan. God says, I made Adam the leader. I'm going to talk to Adam about this. Obviously, they both sinned and God was talking to both of them. But we see in that context, the man is the leader in the marriage relationship. This doesn't mean that he's more important. This doesn't mean that a woman, he's supposed to be disrespectful. Again, a lot of women complain about a man being a leader and the, a woman submitting. But you, when you read that in Ephesians 5, yes, the woman is called to submit, but the man is called to die, okay? He's not called to, he's called to lay down his life for his wife. He's called to sacrifice, provide, protect. And like Christ does the church, he's not called to dominate, rule, uh, make her submit. And when the verse says women, when calls a wife to submit, First off, it says wives, not women. This is not a command to women to submit to men. This is a command for wives to submit to their individual husbands, which is a very big difference because the, that man is giving a biblical type of love, a sacrificial love where he's putting himself last because that's how Christians lead by putting themselves last. And he's laying down his life like Christ does for the church. All she could do in love is submit to this type of love to say, I'm going to support you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to, you know, die where you die. Like, like Ruth said with Naomi, she was submitting to Naomi in that sense. And uh, in this sense, a woman is supposed to be submitting to the love of her husband. This is not like the world imagines it to be where there's this dogmatic man forcing the woman to submit. That's not what we're talking about. Anyway, that was a little bit of a rabbit trail. Dive more into that in the course called Marriage Material. All that to say, men want a, a woman who wants to be this type of woman in his life. Number three, a man wants a woman who wants a man, not a woman who wants a feminine friend. So follow the logic there. A man wants a woman who is looking for a man. He doesn't want to be a woman's girlfriend. He doesn't want to fulfill a feminine role in the woman's life. So when I was preparing this material, I asked the YouTube subscribers to the AGW YouTube channel, I asked the women, what are some questions you have about men when it comes to their thoughts, feelings, and actions in relationships? And the majority of their questions, a, a lot of their questions, revolved around words like emotions, feelings, being open, talking, communication. And they were basically, in summary, wondering, why don't men do this? You know, or how can I make a man do this? Some women were even concerned because they know a man you know, may have been open with them, but he didn't have a lot of guy friends. So she was like concerned. Why doesn't he talk to his friends? Doesn't he need people in his life? And you know, I'm not trying to minimize these questions. I'm not trying to, you know, poke fun at women by any means here. But the, the general way I would answer those types of questions that women have about men is with a simple answer of because he's a man. 
You know, these are not things that men crave like women crave. We have a tendency as humans to assume that what we want and the way we are is the way that everyone should be. And men and women need to be really careful in this aspect because we are different on purpose. God made us different on purpose. So God didn't make a man as expressive as women. He didn't make men to need communication as much as women. Women are like sometimes feeling like, man, a guy just, uh, he's not healthy if he's not communicating a lot. And I would say that that's wrong. Some men are very healthy and they just don't need to communicate as much as some women do. You have a feeling inside of you that says, if I'm not communicating, I'm, I'm not healthy. I, I need other people to know me. Men do not have that need in them as much as women. Of course, they need to be known. Of course, they need to talk to some people, but it's not like it is for a woman. Of course, I'm speaking in generalities here. Some women are less expressive than some men. Some men want to share, want to talk. You, you get what I'm saying. But generally speaking, this is true of men and women. So to put it another way, the way, the reason men don't want or pursue these types of things that women are often pursuing relationally and communication wise is the same reason women aren't playing pickup basketball on the weekends with their friends. They're not uh, into making classic cars and rebuilding a car in their spare time or spending hours upon hours upon hours analyzing the stock market. These are things men often are doing. And the reason women aren't doing them is because they don't want to. That's just not how they're designed. And likewise, men aren't pursuing these other things that women are often pursuing is because they don't want to. That's not how they were designed. Trust me, men are very driven. They know what, if they want something, most like a healthy man, his mind is in goal mode. It's like, how can I accomplish the goal? And he will then come up with a tactic to accomplish the goal. And men know how to get what they want and they pursue what they want. And if they don't know how, they go out and figure it out. They read books, they get coaching, they, they figure it out. They want what they want and then they go after it. And the reason guys aren't going after communication and talking all the time is because they don't want to. It's not what God designed them to be. Now, don't get me wrong. As a man, a good man in your life is going to know that you as a woman are different and he's going to know you do have that need and he's going to go out of his way to make sure he's giving you what he can give you and is giving you the things that you need. So I'm not saying that it's a man's right to ignore or not talk to a woman uh, in his life. Uh, I'm not saying that he should just stonewall her because that's the way he is. Yes, he needs to stretch himself. He needs to open himself up, but he needs to do that for her benefit because that's what she needs from him. That's not what he needs from her. And so another point I want to bring up is that a women need other people in their life besides men. Idolatry is when we take a good thing and use it in a bad way. And when a woman's Id idolizing a man, she imagines a man to be everything that she needs in her life. And that's unbiblical. We need to accept that in that passage, for example, where it says a, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. So you have these different relationships there. We have husband, wife, father, mother, and we could expand that, right? You have pastors in your life. You have mentors in your life. You have coworkers in your life. A husband is not meant to be all of these things in your life. A husband's not meant to be your girlfriends in your life. You need girlfriends. You need women who understand women. I can't relate to a woman like a woman can relate to a woman. And so you need those other people in your life. And a man doesn't want to be forced to be something that he can't be. If you want him to be everything, you miss out on what he can be in your life. And it pushes a man away because he doesn't want to be your girlfriend. He wants to be a man in your life. So in summary, the reason I'm pointing all this out is because most women cannot accept what I'm saying. They really struggle with allowing a man to be a man. And they want a man to be what they think a man should be. And so they, they want him to fulfill this need in them. 
and hopefully he can help with that, but he's not going to be able to be everything that you need. A man wants to be your husband. He wants to be the provider, the protector, the priest, so to speak, not where he's literally your pastor, but he's the spiritual leader in the household when you have children leading the family spiritually. A good man's going to want to be those things in your life. And here's the thing. If he knows that you want a strong man and you want him, that makes him feel like a strong man. On the other hand, if he knows that you're looking for a feminine man who's overly uh, focused on feminine traits, it's going to make him feel feminine. It's going to make him feel weak. It's going to make him feel like you're trying to put him in a role that he doesn't belong in, and that's going to make him not like you. A man wants a woman who can accept him as a man. If you meet a man and you get into a relationship with a guy and he feels like that you accept him as a man and you're not always badgering him and pushing him to be something he's not, this man will love you. He will love you so much because most women can't do that. They can't accept a man for a man. And when a man finds a woman who accepts him for who he is, instead of always trying to change him into something he's not, he loves her because it makes him feel like he wants to be a strong man. Number four, a man wants a woman who complements his mission not detracts from his mission. A man's relationship to his work is very important to him. Not every man loves his job, but every man has some of his identity attached to his place in the world around him. And that's not all bad. Obviously, as I'll talk about in the next lesson, this can get bad. You know, a man can go too far in this area of his life. But a woman typically doesn't crave this like a man does. A woman craves to know her place in the family. A man craves to know his place in the world around him. And this is how God made men and women. Now, of course, I'm not saying a man should neglect his family for his work or neglect his wife for his work, but they have different roles in the family unit. And the man's role is to be a provider and protector. And so God has naturally given him um, um, a greater interest in the world around him. And he needs to know his place in the world around him. Whereas a woman, she's going to work sometimes and, and, and she's going to fulfill a place in the world around her. But in her heart, she's not craving to know her identity in the world. She's really craving to know her place in the family. Do I have a place here. And you can see this when you look at where God cursed men and women when they sinned. God cursed the ground for Adam and it was going to be difficult for him to be a provider. And when you look at the curse for women, it was a curse in regards to relationships. It's, it's going to affect their place in the family. And the curse points to their purpose. The, their sin messed up their purpose. And you can figure out what their purpose was by seeing where the sin messed up. Again, the focus, the emphasis was on the ground, the man's work. Uh, and the focus for the woman was her relationship with her husband and childbearing. So you're really talking about the family there. All that to say, right from the beginning, work was a blessing, a good calling for the man, and it was actually there before the woman was even created. Notice that the man had a job to do before the woman was even made. Now, I'm not saying that work is more important than the woman in a man's life. I'm just saying that a man has a component in his heart that needs to know where his place in the world is, and that's something that God gave him. Some men express this through hobbies, sports, careers. Hopefully, they're expressing it through a ministry calling. Some place in their life will be expressing this desire to, you know, be involved in something outside of themselves and outside of the home. And a woman, a man wants a woman who, who embraces this, accepts this, encourages this. One of the reasons women struggle with this is because they have a tendency to create everything, uh, put everything in the same box, put everything in the same category. And men typically have an ability to compartmentalize different parts of their life. So a man doesn't see a, his career and his 
his wife in competition because he usually sees them in two totally different categories. He loves his uh, his calling or he wants to find a, uh, his place in the world around him. But this isn't like even related to the woman in his life. It's just a different place. It's it's not connected like that. Whereas a woman will see it as a direct competition a lot of times because she has a tendency to mesh everything together. Oh man, he's spending time at his work. That must mean he loves his work more than me. And that's just not how a guy is thinking about it at all. In summary, if a man feels like a woman is a is in competition to his career or his calling or other parts of his life that are important to him that are outside of the relationship, if he feels that way in dating, he's going to assume it's just going to get worse in marriage. And he's probably not going to want to be with that woman because he doesn't want the woman to be in competition with his mission. He wants a woman who will help support him and be a companion and complement to his mission. So let me say it another way. A man isn't going to reject that type of woman because he loves his career more than that woman. Rather, a man will feel like the woman doesn't understand him if she is not supportive of the career or other things in his life that are, that are being expressed through his need to have a place in the world. If he feels like she's in competition or doesn't support that part of his life, it's not that he loves those things more than her, it's that he feels like she doesn't understand him. And when she rejects those parts of his life, it's like she's rejecting his manhood. It's like he's re she's rejecting his masculinity. And a man wants to feel like a man around a woman. And so when she's rejecting that part of his life, it's like hitting something as an, in his I male identity and saying, I don't like this part of you. I want you to be more like a woman. And that repels a man. Notice how the Proverbs 31 woman, her husband had an important place in the world around them. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Would a man like this choose to marry a woman who doesn't understand his need to have this important place in the community around him? No, he's going to choose that type of Proverbs 31 woman who's obviously supporting her man and encouraging him in his role outside of the home. So as a woman, you may not understand a man's passion about his work or his hobby or his mission or his calling, his ministry calling, but honestly, you don't need to understand it. What you really need to do is accept it. As a woman, if you can accept this about a man, even if you don't fully understand it, again, the man's going to love you for that because this is how God made him and he can then feel like you're on the same team and going in the same direction. Number five, a man wants a woman he's sexually attracted to and not sexually distant from. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk about how this good desire gets warped in men and certainly has been corrupted and abused. So I'm not saying that all men's attraction to women is just the way God made them. However, we don't want to overcorrect the obvious flaws that we see in sinful man's behavior in the uh, realm of sexual attraction and desire and idolatry when it comes to that sexual attraction in a woman for a woman. But again, we don't want to overcorrect that. So in Genesis, it's clear that God made men and women to be attracted to each other sexually. Genesis 2, 24 through 25 states, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. For sex to take place, there needs to be physical attraction. Not to get too graphic here, but you literally can't have an erection if you're not attracted to the woman. And without an erection, you can't have sex. So in that passage, clearly there was some physical attraction going on right there. Generally speaking, visual arousal is more important and more emphasized in men than it, as, than it is in women. Again, this can become sinful and completely out of balance, but from the, the design that God made uh, men, and women in, it's acceptable to say and good to say that God made men to want to be visually attracted to the woman that they marry. So much could be said about this, 
So I'm just gonna try to simplify it in the best way that I can. God made all of our bodies differently. Some of us are taller, some of us are shorter. Some of us are a little bigger. Some of us are a little skinnier. Some of us have blonde hair and blue eyes. Other of, others of us have brown hair and brown eyes. And most of these types of things are completely outside of our control. God is going to bless you with a spouse that finds you attractive. But we should be the healthiest versions of ourselves. If God blesses you with a spouse, that person is going to be attracted to the person God made you. All of us, when healthy, will have someone in this world that finds us attractive when we are healthy versions of ourselves. And that's really what I wanna emphasize here. You don't want to try to transform yourself into someone you're not. Embrace the body and the image that God has given you. He made you that way on purpose. But we all can be healthy and unhealthy versions of ourselves. Throughout scripture, we're told to honor God with our bodies. And one of the ways that we honor God with our bodies is by taking care of our bodies and trying to be the healthiest we can be. So when it comes to physical attraction, again, don't try to make yourself look like this worldly person. Don't try to transform yourself into a completely different type because you know this person you like likes a certain type. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is physical attraction is directly linked to physical health. The attributes that are typically associated with a beautiful body are the same attributes that would be associated with a healthy body. So there's, if you look healthy, you're going to look attractive. If you look unhealthy, you're going to look unattractive. And your, un your unhealthiness could be something that keeps a man away from you, just like you're not going to want a guy who looks unhealthy either. I'm not saying that there's a double standard here. No one wants to be with someone unhealthy or un that they're not attracted to. But just know that in men, the visual uh, attraction is important. So you want to just be the healthiest version of yourself. Number six, a man wants a woman who will be a good mother to his children, the children they have together, not a provider for his future children. There really aren't too many gender specific roles outlined in scripture. What people often get wrong is that they over apply marriage and uh, family roles and church roles to the general society at large. There's no scripture that says a woman can't be the boss at work, that she can't be a CEO, that she shouldn't be fully educated, that she shouldn't have the same opportunities in the workforce as men or have the same goals as a man. There's nothing unbiblical if a woman wants to do those things. But there are a few gender specific roles that men and women can only fulfill as men and women, husband and wife. The other one is father and mother. Contrary to the craziness happening in our culture right now, it's clear in scripture that only a father can be a man and only a uh, mother can be a woman. woman. A woman can only be a mother. And a man knows that. So a man isn't looking for a woman who's fulfilling the roles that he already knows he can fulfill on his own. He's looking for a woman to be what he knows he can never be. He can be the provider. He doesn't need a woman who's going to be the provider for his children. He needs a woman who can be the mother because he knows he can't be the mother. Now, obviously, both men and women, husbands and wives, should be actively involved in the rearing, raising of the children. They fulfill different roles, and this is especially prevalent when the children are younger. Typically, women are better equipped to deal with young children, and this is really important for women to understand about men because it's not men don't have the same ability as a lot of women have when it comes to raising young children. And so he can't be mom, literally just cannot be mom. Mothers are often just better equipped at dealing with younger children. They have an ability to multitask. They have an ability to have a greater affection and um, just an agreeableness to deal with children at that age where men like, Yes, we should, we have to be involved, of course, but 
if you put a man in a mother's role all day, every day, you're probably going to end up in the insane asylum. Like his brain will literally explode. Hey, I know women, mothers, our brains are going to explode too during those that age when children are really young. But the God has traditionally and usually blesses a woman with a greater ability in this area. And I say all of that because you can't just substitute and mismatch and switch everything around and expect it to go well. Men can't do what a woman can do. And a man knows that. He knows he can go out there and he can provide. So he's not looking for a woman who can also provide. He's looking for that woman who's going to be able to be a good mother to his children. Now, to balance all of that, I'm not saying that it's wrong for Christian women to work. I'm not saying that a husband should demand that all, you know, all Christian husbands should all demand that their wives be stay-at-home moms. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that women do need to realize their priority is their children when they have children and they cannot let their career come between them and their role in the household. And a man has that same priority, but his career is there to help support the family household. You don't need two people supporting the family in general. You know, you need someone to take care of the necessary practical provisions, and then you need someone to be able to take care of the daily uh, relational things that need to happen with the children, especially when they're young. There are times when a woman's going to need to work, of course. If you don't have enough food, you don't have money to pay the bills, obviously that's a top priority. A woman needs to pitch in and help if that's the case. But a man who sees a woman who values her career more than she values her place as a mother, that's not attractive. That's really what I'm trying to say here. I'm not saying careers are bad. You know, women shouldn't pursue careers. I'm just saying that as a man, what is a man attracted to? He's not attracted to women who value their careers more than they value their motherhood. Proverbs 31, 16 states, she considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. Proverbs 31, 18 says, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. So here we have good evidence that uh, it's very biblical for a woman to be resourceful and uh, have a business-like mindset. But notice that although she is business-oriented at times, her eye is always on her family. Proverbs 31, 21 states, She is not afraid of snow for her household, for her household are clothed in scarlet. A wife and mother can earn money and do business in the world around her, but her first priority is the health of her family. If they need her, she won't let her career get in the way of that. So these next statements I'm about to make are certainly not meant to be offensive. I'm going to try to say them in a balanced way, but I'm going to say them in a blunt way and honest way because I'm making this course to truly help women, not sugarcoat it. I'm just going to tell you how a man truly thinks. And this is how men truly think. A woman's career and education is not a positive in a man when he's looking for a woman. Now, notice what I just said there. I said it's not a positive. I didn't say it's always a negative. Generally speaking, it's either a neutral or a negative. A woman's career, her educational pursuits, her career path is either a neutral or a negative. It's not a positive to a man. And here's why. Men just aren't looking for that in a woman because a man is that for himself. He already, that's his job. He's like, I'm going to be the provider. That's what I want to do in my life. He's not going to look at a woman who has her career goals and say, ooh, I don't like that. You know, he shouldn't anyway. But he's not going to be like, I need that. I need a woman who's going to be super great at her career. I need her to be a provider. That's not what he needs. So in that respect, it's a neutral. It's like, mm, okay, she has, she's super educated. She has a great job. That's cool. You know, but that's not what's going to attract him to her. I've never heard a man be like, man, guess what? She's a lawyer. Guess what? She's the CEO. Guess what? Oh, she makes a lot of money. You know, I have heard women say those things about men, 
because they know deep in their hearts when those early childhood years come when they have children together, they're going to need someone to be the provider. And naturally, it just works best when a man can do that and a woman can take care of the children. So men just aren't impressed with a woman's career or her education or her other abilities in the workplace. Now, if it's your friend or your dad or your brother, they might be like, wow, I'm so proud of you. You know, that is so awesome. And that's really like, I'll be so happy, you know, if my daughter graduates with a good degree and can get a good job. And my father-in-law was obviously very happy with my wife. She's a registered nurse. She's stay-at-home mom now, but she still is a registered nurse. She can work if she needs to. And she did work earlier in our marriage when we needed that dual income. So if you're that, those types of men in your life will be impressed and will encourage that. But when it comes to romance, when it comes to your husband, those aren't things that are his top priority. Now, with all that said, if it, your career and education is important to you, a man will make it important to him. He's not normally going to be looking for that himself, but if he loves you and that's important to you, he's going to be supportive of that. Whereas women don't want to marry a man if he has no career goals. They know that that's an important uh, skill and quality that a man should possess. If he's a loser when it comes to that area, that's going to be unattractive. That's not the same thing carry over when it comes to men. And I say that because culture is lying to you about that. You know, it's like they're saying they're what I'm what I'm trying to counteract is the lie that young women have been sold that their happiness always lies in finding their identity in their career. And for a lot of women, that's just not true. It's good to be a mother. It's good to be a wife. And those are things that we should be celebrating, not condemning. And it's okay if, and it's good, um, it's a positive if she has career goals and she has educational goals. That That's good as well. But when it comes to romance, a man's going to be unattracted to the woman who he senses will prioritize her other goals above her family. And number seven, a man wants a happy woman not a mad woman. So right from the start for this point, let's obviously state what's tr biblically true that only God can make us happy. Only God is the source of joy that our hearts truly need. So I'm not saying that you need to be this happy-go-lucky woman who's always happy in her man and just happy with the guy. Like you need God. Man, men need God. We all got to start there. With that said, as you've probably heard, especially if you've taken my other courses and just looked at my material, and it's just a general truth in most churches who are preaching the truth, men should be the pursuers and when it comes to relationships. And I agree with that principle. But something that's often neglected, that's not often taught, is that women need to be the responders when the men pursue. Yes, men will pursue, but men also want to be validated in a healthy way that their pursuits are well received. Everyone wants to be happy in a relationship, but what I've noticed for the observation and what I'm beginning to see more deeply in scripture is that this takes place differently in the heart of a man and woman. Here's what I've noticed and what I'm learning in scripture is that women want a man to make them happy in, the, in a healthy way. You know, God first, of course, but in a healthy way, a woman wants a man to make her happy. A man would say it differently and wants something slightly differently. A man wants to be able to make a woman happy. So a woman wants a man to make her happy. A man wants a woman that he can make happy. It makes him happy when he can make her happy. That's uh, what a really he craves. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why Paul says what he says in Ephesians 5 verse 33, where he says, husbands love your wives and wives respect your husbands. That verse kind of troubled me in the past because it seems like, why don't women love their husbands? That seems kind of cold. And shouldn't women res or men respect their wives too? Like why the difference there? And I think that's obvious. I know it's obviously true. Women should love their husbands and husbands should respect their wives. But I believe Paul put the emphasis on it like that. One of the reasons perhaps 
is that it's expressing the desires in them both. Husbands, love your wives is an act. And Paul's saying, and the women respond with gratitude and respect for the love that he's giving. So the woman craves the acts of love. The man craves the respects he res- the respect he will receive because of his act of love. He's not craving her to do a bunch of acts of love for him like she's craving from him. Rather, he wants her to respond with respect. That's what he really wants. So here's a practical example when it comes to this principle. You can see this in the way that men and women find happiness when it comes to dates and gifts and romance and things like that. A man's not going to be disappointed. He'll he'll be happy with the gift or the night that a woman planned if she was kind of organizing the date night. But you'll typically find a woman disappointed if a man doesn't plan the date correctly or gets a gift that doesn't relate to her. Whereas a man's like, that's not what he's craving. Like, oh, she didn't plan a great date night and she didn't get the right gift. But you could, you'll hear women complain about those things. He did a bad job of planning. He didn't think about me. He didn't get me the right gift. Whereas a man, she wants those things. What a man wants is he wants her to be happy when he does it. So if a man plans a great night, plans an elaborate romantic evening, gets her a thoughtful gift, He's not looking for her to do the same thing in return. Now pay me back with a great gift. Pay me back with a very romantic night. Rather, all the man wants is for her to be happy with his efforts, to show gratitude and to respect him because of it and to 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 make her happy. That makes him happy. So I say all of that because if a man senses that a woman can never be made happy, that she's that type of woman who's just always going to be impossible to please, that's going to be unattracted to him. He's not going to choose that type of woman. He wants to be able to make her happy. And if he senses that this is just an impossible task, that she's never going to be happy, that's not the type of woman he's going to choose. As I said at the beginning of this lesson, these are all the ideal. This is what God designed a man to want in a woman. These are the, the ideal reasons, the good reasons. Now we need to switch over and talk about how this all got messed up with sin, how the toxic uh, traits of men can corrupt these good desires. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the next lesson. If you enjoyed this content, feel free to head over to AGW University so you can unlock the rest of this course along with all of my other in-depth relationship training courses. And remember, if you enroll before the September 1st deadline, you also get a scholarship and a bunch of free bonuses. To learn more, click the link in the description of this video.